I am Slime Boy. That's what everyone calls me. I kind of like it. I'm a slime boy. I'm such a boy. I got caught with the ankles. You know ankles? They're uh, slime boy. Yeah, okay. All right. Welcome back to part four of the full series analysis of High Guardian Spider. You grew a goatee? Now, even after this episode, I still like to rewrite the show. I, alongside many others, have gone along the task of rewriting the show for others' entertainment. But I'll save that for a future date. For all intents and purposes, this can be called the conclusion of this long series. I again want to thank everyone who's come to subscribe, like, and comment on the videos, and even those who have went out to check out my game. Link in the description. Check it out. We've hit 100 downloads thanks to you guys. I am beyond grateful. Before we jump into episode 12, I would like to start with a retrospective of myself by reading through your comments. It is important to look back on your opinions, to confirm your stances, and to absorb other standpoints. You don't have to agree with every dissenting opinion, but understanding another's viewpoint is an imperative skill to have. If your mindset is flexible, in return your writing will become so as well. I don't see disagreement as a hurdle, more so I see an opportunity to stretch my opinion. As dumbbells are to strength, humility is to creativity. It's impossible to grow if you don't learn, even if it means owning up to a mistake. The more you know, the better, right? But also, from absorbing criticism I will become stronger with every comment made. Anyway, to the comments. If you don't want to see this comment section, there will be a timestamp in the comment and description. A good number of individuals have relayed to me that they've learned from these videos. I'm glad that people have learned something from them. Listen, I'm just an idiot on the internet, as evident from my dyslexic ass missing an extra S in one of my titles. Thanks by the way. Didn't have to insult me, but you could have just pointed it out. <laughs> Just something to add on top of the Azumanga Daioh reference I mentioned in episode 1. If High Guardian Spice is inspired by such a dated material, its work will only come out as dated as well. Many have already said Tokyo Mew Mew seems to be an inspiration. All of the works that seem to be inspirations are very old and dated. High Guardian Spice feels dated even though it came out a few months ago. I question the acting of the characters in episode 2. It makes relatively some sense if they're mimicking college campuses. And my criticism could have been easily negated if the show addressed that all the students are newcomers to being in the school system, which it seems like they're not. Something else to mention is I call High Guardian Spice a cartoon, not an anime, and this thread kind of elaborates on that point. We use words to distinguish them, like Crunchyroll isn't a cartoon seller. They don't sell streaming of cartoons, they sell streaming of anime, and specifically anime because people know why it's called that. There are certain looks to it that make people call it anime. Now, this is really just a fight of semantics at the end of the day. If one person wants to call all cartoons anime or someone wants to say that all anime is cartoons, it really actually doesn't matter. The designator of anime and cartoon are very obvious to most people. This is a great comment about the lack of detail when it comes to character animation or interesting shots at all. There's virtually no life in High Guardian Spice's animation. This is one of my favorite websites called Sakuga Bodu, where you can just see great examples of really good animation. You can find great production materials that show like even singular personalities can do better animation than High Guardian Spice. Like let's use this scene from Haikyuu real quick. You can see the character moving around, their gestures. High Guardian Spice lacks any of this. Most of the time characters are just standing in one place. Not even this much animation to be had. They don't have to have this kind of fine detail, but definitely more than just stationary mouth flaps. So if you're an upcoming animator or whatever, check out Sakuga Bodu. It's a great place to study and learn animation. I'd like to reiterate how many times I might nitpick on the show because High Guardian Spice lacks the rule of cool. I would like to call a comparison to Goblin Slayer again, which also uses commonly used tropes within this series. Yet, Goblin Slayer is able to get away with reusing these tropes because the characters, scenarios, and settings are appealing to the audience. They have some sort of appeal. It's not always cool. Rule of cool doesn't mean just cool all the time. It normally just means appeal. High Guardian Spice is going against its contemporaries in both cartoons and anime, and it can't even stand a chance. It decides to take the middle road, yet it lacks the appeal of anime and cartoons, going for a stale humongous of a product. In episode 4, the writers intentionally misuse the word hypocrite. Once the audience puts together that they're using the word wrong, they lose all sympathy for Sage's conflict. As it becomes apparent to the audience that it's only there to shame conservatives. The episode itself also only exists to give Sage her terror sphere, intentionally wasting your time with all of the mother's conflicts in that episode. The existence of the healing water breaks the world building, generally destroys any sense of conflict, and makes one question how the world even works when such a commodity exists. This begs the question, what exactly are the rules of the magic system in this world? 
The writers are definitely telling the audience, in a not-so-subtle manner, that old magic and new magic can be compared to progressive and conservative. It only makes me wonder, why did Anise use the word conservative instead of traditional if old magic is about ritual? I mean, we know why. Because the writers lack restraint. I think this is damning evidence that the writers obviously didn't give two shits when writing the script, when Rose's hilt is damaged. Yet later on, we would hear that the sword is enchanted and cannot be damaged. The scene only existed for Caraway to say, I'm transgender. I'm transgender. I've come across a few comments about the Olive getting hurt by Rosemary scene. I agree that the scene makes sense, contextually it works. Personally, I feel like they haven't earned such a thing at all. Because when I recall back to everything we've learned or everything we've been told so far in the story, Rosemary's first kill is with those monsters in the cave. She has zero inhibitions about killing them whatsoever. It's never mentioned ever again, even though this is the first time on screen we see her take a life. Even to the point where she stabs one in the belly and blood falls on top of her. We see zero trauma go through her at all because of this moment. She would even witness the death of sentient golems. In fact, the whole cave of Venka is she's surrounded by death. And the only person to come out of that with a feeling of any sort of negativity is Sage. Episode 2 is supposed to cement the ethics that she learned from her teacher. Yet, as I said in my first video, her instinct is always to draw the blade. Even though she was told, don't let the presence of weapons conflict with our sense of justice. We learn nothing about Rosemary's justice at all. These could have easily been remedied with flashbacks of her mother saying, yeah, I had to hurt people. Again, her mother is a high-ranked guardian, famous. Or at least we're to assume. Her mother's sword is famous, the teacher knows about her, and she's even recruited to which country? Spoiler, but I don't care. Any small bits that could help us build Rosemary's character before this moment would have helped this scene. But instead, it seems to come off as contrived because they wanted the moment of her being shocked that she hurt someone, even though everything prior said she didn't care. I'm giving it flack solely because it's so late into the series. Why not have Rose try a different route in stopping Olive? Why is it just attacking with the sword? It's not because I don't understand what they're trying to portray, I think it's dumb. Ultimately, the writers have done a poor job in convincing me to believe this scene. I found there's a cavalcade of distaste towards Sage and Snapdragon's relationship. Unfortunately, I'll burst your bubble. If a hypothetical season 2 came out, here's how their dysfunctional relationship would go about. Sage will break down Snapdragon with the female stereotypes that she's been spouting to him this whole time. Snap will break and go to care away for transition magic. Once Snap becomes a bona fide girl, Sage will fall in love with her. This will cause a strain in Rose and Sage's relationship. The end. Personally, I think the writing's on the wall. I believe the only reason transition magic exists in the show is because the writers, again, are indulgent. Would anyone call what happened to Nepicat transition magic? No? I don't think so, right? Even though it's a fairly similar way that Caraway transforms, through Potion. While Nepi's dose might be weaker, they're very similar. The change itself allows the user to have new organs, Caraway you probably know what kind, Nepicat being new vocal cords that can produce, you know, human language, and a brain that can understand it and use it, but also new physical features, Caraway's is again pretty obvious, Nepi a bit more drastic, but still new features, and by no means is there any inkling that Nepicat is like an illusionary form. That's him, that's his body now. So if you were able to give Nepi a potion over and over and over again, then by all means, because it's similar to Caraway, we should call it transition magic too. But I'm sure the writers would be upset if you were to come to that conclusion since obviously they want transition magic just to be about human transitioning. I want to thank someone for telling me like about beached whales because I had no freaking clue. <laughs> I don't know if they just beached themselves because, oh, I'm about to die, better beach myself. But it makes sense now that this person explained it to me. I'm not a fan that the writers are jumping to the conclusion that Snap should be interested in transition magic just in order to feel like his real self. Garaway should have never even mentioned it. Instead, he should have talked to Snap about exploring the things he likes. I've mentioned it before, but I'm a teacher. I teach martial arts. I've been doing that 10 years now. I have a lot of students. In and out, I see students every day. One of the things that I notice, especially for boys, in more frequent times, I want to say at least the past five years, is that they paint their nails now, something totally seen as feminine. I've seen this from kids as young as eight years old and to like teens up to like 19. And I think this is a great way to explore yourself. At no point should Caraway be like, you know about transition magic? I think he should say, hey, what do you like to do, Snap? What are the things you want to try to do? 
I find it a bit repulsive that the writers say they care about diversity and that their characters are really unique when they push gender norms on all of their characters, especially one like Snap and they say the best way to maybe do it or do the things you like doing is to transition. But this isn't to take away benefit from Amaryllis, who actually does care about the things Snap wants to do even enough to confide in him. Most men don't have someone to confide to. They don't have people to talk to their emotions about. And Amaryllis is there for her Snap. So if there is any saving grace to Snap's character, it is Amaryllis. Only when together are these two great. From not just a character perspective, but also the writing as well. It's just unfortunate that they're being handled by very lousy writers. No offense to this comment, I'm sure you know more about the topic than I do, but I'm almost certain from the way the characters were acting, they were talking about something more adult rated. Some have pointed out my uninformed opinions, and as such, I've removed those parts from my video. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to learn. Unfortunately, we have to talk about transition magic a little bit more, since I believe it's just a point of contention because it's so jarring to the story itself. As stated, it is reversible. So what is the point? What's the big deal about it? Originally, I was going to agree. There was no big deal. The writers go out of their way to make transition magic seem like the most wonderful thing ever. And this detracts from Snap's general conflict. Let me explain. Magic allows one to transform into anything they want. In episode 12, we'll find out that shapeshifters naturally exist in the world, people who can change their form at will. One we've already been introduced to, Olive. Caraway's method lasts a month. So now we can make the assumption that Snap would live out in a female body for at least a month. Until we call upon episode 9, where Amaryllis drops the hugest bombshell that well, all, all magic, magic can, can be, reversed. be reversed. All magic. She isn't saying old magic. She isn't saying new magic. This is one of the many inconsistencies of magic that are in this show. The possibility of Snap just transforming into a woman for a day now exists because all magic can be reversed. And now all of the ramifications of changing for a whole month, being a totally different person, maybe even having to lie to his parents, his family, his friends about his new assumed identity is gone out the window. All because the writers didn't care to double check their script. This entire character conflict is non-existent now. Of course, this doesn't change the feelings that Snap has, but the solution is there in front of him with no ramifications at all. Anyway, thanks for the comments, guys. Now the time is at hand, the final episode. I believe this final episode is the embodiment of a selfish writer, or in this case, writers. Well, look who's here to greet me, Olive. Mandrake. The story finally reaches competency with the arrival of Mandrake. I'm shocked you're still alive. And I'm not shocked you're as ugly as ever. Oh, I think I'm adorable. <laughs> what a cute little kitty. Can I break its neck? An overly edgy bad guy with a bit of charm and a large tendency towards murder. If we hadn't wasted six episodes with zero meaningful conflict, we would have had a marginally better show. Please don't get me wrong though. This would have still been a shit show, but at least a little bit more entertaining. The series could have performed better with a Monster of the Week format. The Triumvirate told me to give you this, a new Terrasphere. <laughs> You're working for me now. I don't need you here. And yet, here I am. Now the one thing I love more than anything else in the story are antagonists. Call me a sucker for evil. It's one of the major reasons I still watch Shonen. Mandrake is one of the easiest villain archetypes to write, but somehow the writers still flubbed this. High Garden Spice could have had better ratings if the show was about the duo Olive and Mandrake opposing our main characters. The audience can then experience their approach towards each situation, because at the end of the day, antagonists raise stakes naturally. Smokeface, this psychopath is trying to tell me that he's- In charge, yes. And if you value your life, you'll do as he says. Show me the targets, I'll do the killing. I have a better plan. Your plan is rejected. Leave no one to tell the tale. Fine, but this is grog shit and you know it. Be a good little kitty and do what I tell you to do. The scene of Olive being reprimanded doesn't seem justified, at least in my opinion. We don't understand what she stands for. The scenes of her being a cat don't add anything to her character. It would be far more interesting if we got a redemption arc from Olive, owning up to the mistakes she had made till now. The only designator to tell us that Olive is a good person, besides being in this show, are the evil looking men who accompany her. We're here, for the final episode, Attack on Titan. 
Oops, I mean Attack on High Guardian Academy. So while the first episode required three writers to write filler, the final episode isn't even directed by the creator Ray Rodriguez himself. The final goddamn episode. That 2019 trailer where we hear people talking about diversity and their all-female writing staff did the least amount of work possible. Whatever animation they did was minimal at best since the whole show was outsourced to a Korean studio. It's very evident that no second passes were done to the script at all. And if they were, this is an utter joke. If I was working on an animation team in Korea, I would be upset. Especially since Crunchyroll decided to shelf this show for almost three years. The least that could be done for this final episode is Ray you could direct it. This will be on the final. Now stop by my office if you have any questions. Do you see this, this joke? Is this a giant or did they just overlay at the wrong time? How did this happen? They shelved this for three years. They took whatever portion of your subscription money and ran with it to make this stupid show and then held off until controversy died down. It's very good that High Guardian Spice is getting criticized because this is a joke. I rarely mention the whole Crunchyroll subscription money because I can make the assumption that they also had investors make this show as well. But obviously it couldn't have been much money since they decided to shelve the show for so long. The investors didn't want their money back at all? Animation is quite expensive, no matter how shoddily put together. If someone can, please tell me the budget for this show. In the comments below, if someone's got that information, let me know. I feel like I could fund an anime and I've got like barely anything in my bank account. Daydreaming about cake again? Uh, is class over? Mm-hmm. It's the Saipeth, isn't it? He's all I can think about. <sighs> Me too. Him and Olive. This, I believe, is by far one of the most disingenuous scenes in the show. The creators didn't earn this. And at worst, it's forgotten about once another conflict arises. Sometimes I miss being a kid when we didn't have to deal with all this stuff. We wasted time on filler instead of actually seeing the girls grow up. And then it's rushed in in the final few episodes. With only three of the episodes actually being important. What we have here is still dough, it's not even baked yet, cause it needed to cook a little longer. The girls only have two missions under their belt for the entire season. We don't get enough time to see the girls grow up. One mission the girls are protected by the strongest plot armor that any isekai protagonist would love to have. The second mission is one that they're wrongfully assigned to. Despite that, the girls get exonerated of any guilt from all the other characters around them. The tone of the show flip flops all over the place like a fish out of water, confused on what it's supposed to be. The writers themselves are very selfish, they want to just have all of the reward without doing any of the work of building up to this scene at all. I'm going to make an unfair comparison to Naruto real quick, but it's something I like and I think it's pretty apt to the situation. One of my favorite moments in Naruto is the Obito flashback. Those who would abandon even one of their friends are worse than scum. So I'm going to choose to break the rules. If doing that somehow makes me less of a true shinobi, then I'll just go and crush all of the so-called real shinobi. Especially its name, Boys on the Battlefield. I love it. It sticks to my head till this day. I've never forgotten it ever since I've read it in the volumes. While it's only a few episodes long, it adds to the detail of the world. I would even dare to say that this flashback stands on its own. The material helps build Naruto's world, and especially his character Kakashi. <laughs> No! No! If only I'd come with you from the start like you told me to, this never would have happened. And how he had to grow up, two boys living on the battlefield, coming to terms with life and death. Whatever the village or anyone else may say. I think that you're a great journey. It's true. That's how I really feel. Now I know there's shenanigans that happen later on in Naruto, we won't talk about that for spoiler reasons since Naruto's a very long series, but High Guardian Spice lacks its boys on the battlefield moment, or in this case, girls on the battlefield. Now you know Rosemary and Sage. Can't wait to kill him. What is wrong with you? What's wrong with you? This is my job. Bring Rosemary to witch country to see her mom is cleaner. Her mom's in witch country? Her mom is lavender. The Lavender? <laughs> We're gonna have a blast. We get a reveal that Rosemary's mother is lying in wait in which country and she wants Rosemary. I like to call Mandrake's response to Olive to attention. We can make the assumption she was qualified for this job. So why is it that everyone is questioning her? Olive needed more time to be fleshed out before her inevitable betrayal of Mandrake. If this was a kid's show, 
her betraying Mandrake wouldn't be questioned. As a child would easily see that as a cool thing of, oh my God, she betrayed him, that's really cool. Remember when we were little, you would insist on sun naps. Oh uh, yeah. You always said when things feel too dark, we just had to lie in the sun and lighten up. Come on, Rose, let's take a sun nap right now. <laughs> but it's cloudy. So what? We'll just imagine the sun. From now on, I'm going to refer to scenes like this as wasted potential. And what I mean by this is if a character references something that should have been shown to us earlier to really cement the meaning. We need the scenes like this when come time of the climax, we can see how much the status quo of the girls enormously has changed. Rosemary. <gasps> I is that you? It is me. Come quick. Mom? I, what, what, I knew you were alive. Sage and Rose are separated. We hear the voice of her mother, but in reality is Mandrake assuming her form. There are enemies in the school, and you can't tell anyone that I'm back. Well, not even my friends. I tell them everything. I tell Not even them. Tell me what you and your friends know about the rot. Do you know what's causing it? No. <gasps> Do you know? It's my mission to find out who else knows about it. Well, Sage? Oh, she's gonna want to see you. Oh, and time and parsley! Rose then spills the beans to the fake Lavender about everything they've been up to. I'm just assuming Rose's loyalty to her mother is higher than that of her friends, so I'll let this one pass. Oh, and I fought this cat girl, Olive? I, I, I cut her. Badly. Sometimes we have to hurt people to protect what's important. Thanks, Mom. Rose being conflicted on hurting Olive persists into this episode, which is good. While ultimately good, I'm not going to give the writers a pass for this since they're consistent screw ups. And this one good act of writing isn't enough for my merit. So to each their own, if you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. Because no sympathy is spared for Mandrake at all. Maybe because he's a man. Maybe so. I think so. You've done well. I've missed you so much. Oh, Professor Carraway. Professor Carraway. I saw him writing about it in his journal. You should ask him. Mom? Mom! And even worse, they play up the cliche of, oh no, I got distracted at the last second because they said something, even though thrusting a knife takes very little time. This is beyond stupid. Like, I'm losing brain cells from just seeing this. Where have you been? Oh, I... I'm not allowed to tell you. You have my full attention. Since when do you keep secrets? Since my... Rose? I can't tell you. Rose! I cannot Rose. listen to this all day. <laughs> I saw my mom! We then learned that Rosemary cannot keep a secret. Another scene of wasted potential. We should have learned this earlier. It would have been an important lesson on her innocence. Shoddy writing aside, she relates to the group that she met her mom, and she told her everything. This would have been a great moment for infighting. Time could have easily said, I told you not to tell anyone. And Rose saying, that's my mom though. She wouldn't betray me. With such a small change, we have increased the tension in the show. I mentioned Caraway. She disappeared. <gasps> Caraway's office. But instead, all of the characters want to go to Caraway's office. Caraway. Oh good, you're in. Oh, girls. To what do I owe the pleasure? What happened to your desk? Oh, the, the mess? Uh, Lavender and I were looking for something. What? Oh. Mandrake, assuming Caraway's identity, is walked in by the girls, but only to be walked in by Caraway right afterwards, and then they have a little scuffle. As referenced in episode 2, Caraway says old and new magic cannot exist without each other, and so he uses both of them in tandem as an attack, which is then witnessed by Sage. Stay low! I don't think he'll go far. You used uh. old and new magic together. A solid foundation in old magic gives one the potential to merge their strengths. A skill you'll learn in time. Now I'm confused. What the hell is old magic? Is it just glyphs? I thought there was ritual to it. But if writing glyphs is all you need, what's the real difference between old and new? One is stored and one isn't? Is it speed? Is it output? From things stated earlier in the series, you can assume that old magic was akin to alchemy. But in this case, if it's just glyphs, then what was the big deal of Sage transferring from one to the other? And since magic is never defined, the writers can pull whatever they want out of their ass. 
The result of the fight is Mandrake gets blown out of a window with no one giving chase to him at all. Intruder on the school, no one chases him. Caraway doesn't even like do a live speaker magic and say, hey, we have an intruder, we have an intruder, evacuate the students. Instead he's like, let him get away, he won't get far. But anyway, let's jump back to Sage real quick. Why was Sage never informed on the methodology of mixing new and old magic? It seems pretty simple enough. Simple enough that she can just do it in this final episode with no strain whatsoever. Is it difficult to do this? But if it's beneficial to use both, why is there such a heavy push for new magic? Because new is new, and the writers have no idea what that means? New stuff good, old stuff bad. Who was that guy? A shapeshifter. A highly dangerous shapeshifter. We've had a run-in with a girl who could turn into a cat. Then assume there's more than one. I'll gather the teachers. Caraway then informs us that Mandrake is a shapeshifter. Great, another thing that could transform. I'm done with this show. So the real question is, when Mandrake turned into Lavender, did he still have Mandrake Jr.? But in all seriousness, how does Caraway know this? Simply because he could transform? Do shapeshifters have any distinguishing traits? No thought went into introducing this new race of people at all. Is it even a race? Or is it just a job classification? What about Olive? Why can she only change into a cat? What are rules? <laughs> the writers don't know them, I sure don't. You girls, stay together. Don't engage and don't alert the other students for their own safety. Got it. So my mom wasn't really here. Rose, let's find him. Rose's decision to defy Caraway and give Trace to the intruder Mandrake could be seen as a good act of defiance, but I honestly don't know why she's doing it. Is it solely because he transformed into her mother? Is that really enough to give Chase and endanger anyone else? This could be a great way to show her determination to see her mother again. Yet, this doesn't go anywhere. Since the girls are not punished for aggravating the situation, and end result leading to a fight that burns down the school. If even one teacher reprimanded them, I think this would have been a fine moment. Shots everyone! Say no to that. <laughs> I thought I asked for poison. We're not supposed to draw attention! Despite knowing Mandrake for only this episode, I'm quite fond of his transformation skill, or shapeshift skill if you want to call it that. And even on a conceptual level, characters like Mandrake are a goldmine for drama. This is just total wasted potential though. If he was around earlier, he could have done so much damage to the characters, and in return give us a lot of juicy conflict. What are you planning? I don't have to explain myself to you. Is this everyone? We didn't see anyone else in the hallways. What's going on? Now what, boss? Now we kill everyone. <laughs> the whole school burned down. You can't! The girls, the girls aren't in there. What? Why? They didn't follow your orders, boss. <laughs> The dynamic duo put all the teachers to sleep and trapped the student body in the forge. What do you expect? Them actually killing someone? Were you expecting risk? Stakes? Anything? I hope not. Unfortunately for our bad guys, the main characters aren't trapped in there. Mandrick proceeds to burn the door down and enforce it with magic. But I can only see this as a dumb move. He decides to trap all the students in a forge. A place that is known to have lava made of bricks and stones with no wooden foundation to be seen anywhere outside of the door. We can make the assumption the forge is fireproof, or at least very resistant to fire. He traps a bunch of magic students who have their terror spheres and plenty of weapons in the forge. The writers are essentially wasting your time with this piss poor setup. Mandrake was better off doing a lit from Black Clover. Since it seems he has infinite magic, we'll talk about that later. You'll see for sure. Where are the inseparables? Not here. There's smoke pouring in now. We're all gonna die. Okay. Get us out of here. Fire. Hello. 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 This scene only exists to reaffirm Snapdragon and Amaryllis' character growth, but they don't deserve such a weak scenario for the resolution of their character arcs. Like writers, put them in actual danger. Look. And Olive's with him. No one in, no one out. Mandrake then surrounds the entire school in the barrier. 
At this point, I came to the realization that this is just a children's show written by inept writers who think adults don't care about world building or cohesive storytelling. Let me elaborate. We don't know the general limitations of magic. Let's use Mandrick as a prime subject. He can use magic to instantly transform. I'm assuming the limitation is he has to have seen them before, but has he ever met Caraway? We know that old magic is used through ritual or glyphs, and new magic is performed with terra spheres, but there's zero explanation on why Mandrake is able to use his sword magic with no terra sphere in sight, and why he can produce so many of them. He can also produce massive amounts of fire, at will. Alongside all of this, he made this large barrier. So the real question is, what is magic? Well, it's magic, duh. But more importantly so, what is the set limitation? Do humans have a power source? Can they use magic forever with no limitation? Is it stamina based? Mana based? Mandrake would later get injured, but why can't he just heal himself? He already has a multitude of different types of magic. A barrier skill is already defensive, so it's ridiculous not to expect him to have a healing spell. Mandrake by far is the most adept mage we've ever seen in the show, but somehow he'll lose to a bunch of fledgling heroes. At this point, the series should've went the total comedy route. That way, instead of having rules, they could play everything off as a gag. Sage, Parsley, put out the fires! Time? Help me catch this asshole! Rosemary has never been this feisty before. This is a betrayal of her betrayal so far. I'll do it! There's no need to kill anyone! Mandrake, my plan can still work. If we put out the fires, take the girls, nobody has to die. Don't be so naive. <laughs> my first crush, meet by the books that start with the first letter of his dumb name. Clever, Rose. Well. A for Aster. Aster, who that? So if anyone can use magic utilities, why are mages even employed? You can literally get a knight who can hold both a weapon and a magic utility at the same time. If the ordinary person could use an item like this, why would you need guardians? These kind of tools can be easily repurposed as weapons to defend the city. So, shapeshifter, do you like cheesecake? What's your name, anyway? M for Mandrake. Not as dumb as A for Aster. I read your diary. Oh, and by the way, you draw swords like dogs. Hey! So at this point, the show is content with making his out-of-place sexual remarks. I still err on the side that the tone should have been set way earlier if they wanted to do something like this. <laughs> Mandrake, let me do it. Really? You were right about me. I've been a mess to attach to these four. It's time to free myself. We never should have given you that tuna. Mm. Yeah. This is a good moment for Olive, but it's unfortunate the show is nothing but a bucket of wasted potential, and it's already kicked over. I said it for episode 9, but she has the best character acting in the show. Her contemplative glance at the floor, conveying the message easily. Am I really going to do this? Well, I guess so. Now despite Mandrake getting stabbed, he pulls an impressive magic skill out of his ass. My question is why did he not just project it towards the girls, filled in a room full of books and wood? Who put you in charge? I did. You got a problem? No. Snap, you're in charge of the non-mages. Get the teachers ready to be carried out of here. Old magics, you have a sigil spell for a protective shield, right? The students stuck in the forge indeed have their terror spheres on them, and Amarils makes a call out to the old magic users at the school. But are there any? The school pushes new magic to everyone, and everyone else we've seen in classes are using new magic. Why would Sage not be in the class with those people? This final fight takes place in the best set piece so far, Burning Library, but despite that, we're only rewarded with a fairly boring fight scene. What happened to the choreography of Episode 9? Ah! 
Parsi and Time get ditched for the final portion of the fight in favor of Olive being there instead. This aerial fight lacks the needed speed and weight to convey a dogfight. Mandrake, despite his injuries, is still going strong. At this point, I'm rooting for him to win. Or at least, there's no real reason for him to lose. I ask why the all-powerful Mandrake is even continuing this fight. At this point, he knows there's no chance of winning. He's no guardian. Running away is always an option. As far as he knows, his assailants are injured and can't give chase. You know what your problem is. You're weak, Olive. But instead, he decides to kill Olive because her, her, I'm an evil guy. Evil guy, evil. What lousy writing. I'm pretty sure this isn't supposed to represent anything, like the character coming full circle in her character arc, since to me it just seems like she cut her hair to match the original designs Rey created way back when. But let's make an unfair comparison to a way better series, Naruto. If you spent a little less time shampooing, and a little more time practicing your jutsu, you might not be in this fix. You think that maybe, just this once, when it's life or death, you think that just maybe I could come through? Come on! <sighs> it's pointless, that won't work on me. It's not meant for you. All this time, you've all been teaching me something. I just found out! Sasuke likes girls with long hair! Well, well, I see someone's grown her hair long. Looks like I'm not the only one. It's about time I learned the lesson. No more caving. Now it's my turn to take the lead. It's all on me. There's no one else. Say so long, kid! Sakura grows her hair out with the impression it would get Sasuke's attention. In the tuning exam, she cuts her hair, the symbol of her letting go of the shallow things in the world she lives in, just in order to become a better ninja. Now that's thematic. Anyway, moving on. March their strength. The wise sage finally, finally, combines old and new magic. To me, this is wholly unearned. We rarely see sage ever use old magic. One time is off screen in episode two, and the other time is in the beginning of episode three when they're showing like each of the character highlights, and she's only lighting candles at that point in time. The entire series, she's Terra Sphere Sage, never relying on old magic to solve any of her real problems. The Scypeth, no old magic involved. The Halloween thing, no old magic involved. The Cave of Inca, no old magic involved. After Sage's successful random power up, she blasts Mandrake into the barrier. My only thought is, Mandrake is dead, sent packing into a static barrier with enough force to send them flying across the sky. And then in the most comical manner, the stabbed man falls down the tree hitting every branch on the way. This dude's dead. The appearance of normal modern firefighters is jarring, especially when we see the water gloves. So why are they dressed in firefighter uniforms? Because Mandrake needed a disguise to escape. Again, this is a joke. And with that, High Garden Academy is destroyed. I want to recall the moment of the infinite hallway. The school has zero intrigue at all. The one moment we get anything interesting, they do nothing with it. What can you tell me about the school? If we break down the episodes where the school is actually being prominently seen, episode 2, 3, 6, and 10 are in the school. Four episodes. 
out of a 12 episode series. A third of the season is in the school. The rest of it is out of the school. You tell me if the writers earned this ending of the school being destroyed and the characters looking woefully upon it. And then the writers have the audacity of making episode 11 about a sister school when the original school isn't even grounded yet in the world. There is nothing defining High Guardian Academy from any other fantasy magic school out there. Once again, the selfish writers think they've earned this reward, yet they've done none of the work to build up to this scene. You mixed old magic and new magic perfectly. Combining them felt so right. You're pretty great too. <laughs> nah. Careful! I'm wielding a weapon, which you do with great competency. Rose. We will find her. Together. Okay, sure. Rose gave her this haircut with that sword. Why did she just not use scissors? It's also another scene of wasted potential. I've never seen Sage compliment her on her sword work. Ever. At this point, are these two even friends? Maybe the writers don't know what friendship is. I wouldn't be surprised, Miss Kate left. Get along, man. Hashtag. Sorry, I had to put the last one in there. You found time for a haircut? I mean, I value fashion as much as the next woman. I love how you're looking right now. <laughs> it looks great. Oh, so do your nails. Okay, time to go, Snap. More pushing of a ship that a majority are against. Sick moves yesterday, High Guardian Spice. Because of our names. It's perfect. Yeah! <laughs> also, apparently none of them are named after spices. They're all herbs. Come on, writers. Are you going to Scarborough Fair? Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. And with that, High Garden Spice comes to an end with no season two in sight which is the best blessing we could ever pray for. The show ended being meant for no one but the creators themselves, while the money people trusted with Crunchyroll gets wasted on a shelved product like this. But we have more after the credits. Bring him forth. Show me mercy! This is Olive's fault! Silence! What do you recommend? <laughs> Execution. Revealing Lavender to be the surprise, shock, horror antagonist. Is this supposed to hype us for season two? Why would anyone be confident for a season two with such a botched season one? By the end of the season, the writers had became a smidge better. Or better yet to say, Kate Leth wasn't writing as many of the last episodes, so maybe that's why the episodes are better. Ooh, that's a good one. Still, I won't give them too much credit since adding an antagonist is an obvious thing to make any semblance of writing a story easier. In my honest opinion, High Guardian Spice is objectively bad. Don't watch it. High Guardian Spice teaches a valuable lesson to naive and selfish writers who want to only make material they like without polishing their own craft. Art is a reflection of the creator, but all creators should strive to improve their craft in order to visualize their dreams. This is not to say don't write what you want to write. Your individuality is necessary in making art, but the foundation is necessary as well, especially if you intend to sell it to the public. If High Guardian Spice stayed a Tumblr comic, it wouldn't have gotten the backlash it received, but instead, it became a tale of selfish writers. Crunchyroll should look for works that are at least proven before wasting their subscribers' money, time, and what little good faith they might have had. I want to thank everyone for watching. Check out my game, first link in the description. I'll work on the rewrite of High Guardian Spice sometime in the future. I'm going to take a little break from it. Let's talk about some anime that are coming out more recently. Uh, I just saw Orient came out, so maybe I want to talk about that. So expect a video on that. Maybe some shorter videos for sure. And I just unlocked the YouTube community post, so I'll be posting blogs on there as well. So hopefully those will be good reads for you. Anyway, peace out, take care, and don't forget, we never stop growing. I'll see you next time. <laughs>